Bonacci, Bonacci, to hand the presente. Wonderful to have you here. I'm very glad to have you here in the room. And I also see at the moment some 17 people online following this lecture. I am very glad that we also celebrate the week of the SDGs. When you entered the university, you already saw the flag there on the SDGs. And this is also a contribution to the SDGs because number four of the sustainable development goals is quality education. And education in the mother tongue is really so precious and so important. And therefore, it's worthwhile to fight for Papiamento. And I'm very glad that we have one of these experts on Papiamento here in the room, Dr. Bastian van der Felden teaching at the Open University in the Netherlands, but a former lecturer of the University of the Netherlands Antilles in Curaçao from 2006 to 2009, where he also yeah, took the effort to elaborate a complete new uh, subject translating into Papiamento, legal translating Dutch Papiamento. And it was a big success, a wonderful subject. And we realized it's possible to develop a legal academic language in Papiamento. And from this point of view, we invited Bastian for a PhD talk to see when you write your PhD on a completely different subject, like he wrote his PhD on the use of the Frisian language in the court, that this knowledge you can later apply to another language and then even within the kingdom. So I'm very glad to welcome Bastian von der Felden. And I will also like to use this occasion to invite you all to my inaugural lecture, which take place next week on Tuesday, and which will also be on the use of language or languages. So welcome and the floor is to you, Bastian, and thank you for being with us. Bonacci, Bonacci. I'm gonna talk in English tonight. Um, don't know why, but uh, maybe there is a good argument to do it because I want to address not only here the audience in Aruba, but also the people living on Saba and Stacia for whom the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages could be very important in the near future. So since they're the local language is English, we continue today in English, but a lot of the material I collected and I'm going to use is also in Dutch. So it will be translingualism using the two or three languages mixed a little bit. I'm sorry for that, but translating everything was simply, yeah, too, not too much work, but all the nuances are so... Yeah, on the millimeter that it's hard to do. So I think that the lecture of tonight will fit perfectly in the week of the social development goals. There's a big flag in front of the university and also the work of the Open University where I work in the Netherlands perfectly fits in this lifelong learning concept. For those who want to know more, there is a lot of information available on the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages. So in the next days, please have a look at this website of the Council of Europe. And there you find the text of this treaty. You find the explanatory report. You find the reports the Dutch government wrote to explain what they did for the languages in the Netherlands in the past years. You can also find the text easily in Dutch when you want to use that. Or on Wikipedia page, you find a link to the right spot in legislation. So what are we going to talk about? We are going to talk about the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages. This is an international treaty, and it was developed by the Council of Europe. So this is not the European Union. It's the Council of Europe, a much broader organization, mainly focusing on democracy and culture 
in Europe, but also human rights are an important field for their work. In the 1990s, or maybe a little bit earlier, but in at least in the years 1990 till 1996, there was a lot of work performed to write a charter for regional or minority languages. And this was a very difficult task. On the one hand, the idea to give groups certain rights was not so beloved. The idea that someone then you have to identify someone as a member of a group, an ethnic group, and of course, no one really wants to do this. But it was clear that people who want to use their language must have the possibility to do this and to also transfer this knowledge to next generations. Second big problem was that there are languages in Europe, like the Sater Fries in Germany, spoken by 1200 people. And there are languages, the uh, Catalans, which is spoken by 5 million people. So you have to come with one treaty protecting and promoting very small languages and very big. So I'm going to talk later how they achieved this goal. So it's about historically regional languages of Europe. Well, this work Europe, don't take it too serious. It is about also Article 1. When you look it up, you see that it, it's about languages that are not an official language and spoken by a minority or by a group smaller than the people speaking the official language of a country. Oh. And now it gets more difficult. Maybe some of you read the Algemeen Dagblad or other newspapers papers in the past weeks where there were analyzes about part two and part three of this charter saying that part three was not feasible, but part two was. Um, so let's first look in this part two and part three. So article one simply say, states what is a regional or minority language. And this is quite a simple threshold. It shouldn't be an official language and it should be spoken historically in a certain country. Then this part two is applicable on all regional or minority languages spoken within the territory. So here the states have no possibility to decide what is a regional or minority language when the speakers of this language stand up and explain that they want to have protection, they are entitled to this protection. And this part two is very general protection saying that the state is not allowed to take measures against the language, that it must promote exchange of language speakers between different countries and so on and so on. I'm not going to discuss in detail this respect for the geographical area of each language, uh, but it's about the idea that, for example, nowadays in the Netherlands, Friesland was a province and Frisian is broken there. Uh, 20 years ago, there was a court in Friesland, then it was transferred to Groningen, and now it's transferred to Arnhem. So the geographical area of this court was getting larger and larger and larger. And when you change such geographical areas, it may not be harmful for the respective languages. 
Then there is part three. And for part three, the states have to make decisions. There is a long menu, and I'm going to discuss this menu in the next PowerPoints, and you will see it's words, words, words. And for every important field of society, education, justice, administrative authorities, media, cultural activities, economic and social activities, there is a menu. And depending on the status and size of the language, a country can decide to protect it under a very minor protection or a much wider protection. Let's say we will see it later, allowing it in secondary school only as a subject or as the language of instruction. The parties must at least apply from this long list of paragraphs, 35 paragraphs. And for certain fields, they must at least ratify one, two, or three paragraphs. Um, yeah. Ah, okay. Um, and the third very important part of this charter is a sort of accreditatie. The People here at the university will love that word, or maybe ISO 9002 certification. So the Dutch government has picked a certain number of paragraphs from all these fields of society and said they will guarantee minimum measures in these fields. Every two years, there is a committee of experts coming to the Netherlands discussing with the civil servants, whether this protection level was reached or not. Quite often you see, for example, that there are perfect laws. They are beautiful. For example, the use of Frisian in court is really a perfect law. But no one uses the possibility to use Frisian in court. So then questions are posed. Well, we heard that no one is using Frisian. How can you promote the use of Frisian, let's say, of free speech of people in court? The reports written by the Dutch government and then the analysis of these reports by the Committee of Experts are published on the website of the Council of Europe. There are also published the, the uh, let's say, advice or the sort of the Council of Ministers of the Council of Europe gives the Dutch government in the end certain points of attention to address in the next years. Um, and I'm going to to the next slide a short history. This committee of experts was used by several NGOs in the past years to get their foot behind, between the door to be heard in Europe, but also in the Netherlands. So first of all, a short history. There is this charter for regional and minority languages. And I was trained to use it. I wrote my PhD in this field, a book of 600 pages. It was published in 2004. So then the charter was signed by the Netherlands only a couple of years, but at least I knew something about it. And in the process of state reform going on between 2006 and 2010, I was a little bit puzzled by the status of international treaties, especially international treaties protecting human rights in this new 
state structure. The Netherlands in Europe or whatever they call it, signed a lot of international treaties. And for every treaty, I'm coming back to this slide later, for every treaty in the yellow structure on top, they asked Aruba and the Netherlands and Tilly's whether these countries would like to have co-signed, so to say, or have it applicable on their territory. Then the state reform came and the Netherlands became responsible in the green on the bottom, not only for this territory in Europe, but also for Bonaire, Saba and Stacia. These three islands were taken out of the Netherlands Antilles and Curaçao and St. Martin were independent from that date. So for every international treaty signed by the Kingdom of the Netherlands, there had to be made a re-evaluation whether it would be applicable only in the Netherlands in Europe, on Aruba, on Curaçao, on St. Martin. There are long, long lists, and I think a couple of civil servants are working on these lists of hundreds of international treaties. And we can all understand the, the Rhine Treaty uh, governing the, the ships on the River Rhine is not useful for Curaçao. Or one of the other islands here. So we can imagine that not all international treaties are similarly applicable in the whole of the kingdom. For human rights related treaties, it becomes more tricky looking at the Statut and the Dutch Grundwet, the Dutch Constitution, human rights ought to be at the same level for the whole of the kingdom. So when at a certain moment I found out that there was a sort of iron curtain over the Atlantic Ocean, having certain human rights in Europe and not on Bonaire, Saba and Stacia, although these were gemeentes of the Netherlands in Europe, so administratively, they were simply part of the Netherlands in Europe. I was puzzled at first. I started trying to find out what to do. So what do you do? There is a Simon di Cultura and you give a first lecture. Second lecture, we organized this teaching in law and language together with Marta Dijkhoff, who was a former minister of the Netherlands Antilles, who had the perfect network in all the islands down here. So when at a certain moment, two islands uh, of bestuurscollege leden, uh, two members of the, let's say, local government of Bonaire, came to my office in 2007, they said, we understood you know something, we do not know. So I explained them the charter. I explained the structure. I referred to the status of Frisian. And I explained them that apparently there is an iron curtain in the ocean. I think the most important was for me also at that moment already not to have an other international treaty on human rights somewhere applicable. The most important is that due to this three year revision, this committee of experts coming to the Netherlands, the Dutch government becomes also responsible for the language. When the Dutch government has to report every two years, they have to come up with a serious report. So they are also responsible for laws, measures, whatever you want to call it, 
to protect and promote Papiamento from Baumenaire. That was my idea. So what do you do? I wrote a big, big plan, a sort of roadmap, what to do. And step by step, I was fine, very happy to see that it really unfolded. First of all, we had the Bestures College and a little bit later, also the Island Council of Bonaire writing motions and letters to the Dutch government that they want to have the charter applicable on Papiamento on Bonaire. This resulted in a much better legislation in this IBES and ABES legislation for the 101010. In first instance, only the oath in Papiamento was allowed. After a couple of letters, at least there was a good minimum standard possibility in the ABES and IBES, which made it possible, and we will discuss that later, that Bonaire, the island of Bonaire, could make a local bylaw on the use of language in the local administration. Then, of course, I can talk. Yes, I can talk, I think. Uh, but I can only talk for myself. I'm working in academia, Mita Papia Papiamento, but no one will be happy to listen to that. Um, so I needed. NGOs, non-governmental organizations, people on Bonaire who were supporting the idea to get the charter applicable on the island. Luckily, the Academia Papiamento was founded in 2009 and they kept on organizing events, lectures, but also the Dictado Papiamento and many, many other things up to now. They are very important as a support group from the island. They are the people we work for. And the second organization was Splica in the Netherlands um, because they had a perfect network in the The Hague, in the parliament, in whatever was happening in The Hague. Um, then, 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 then came. And it was astonishing. It was also disappointing to see that there can be an iron curtain for human rights on the ocean. I think the Raad van State, the Dutch Council of State, really did sloppy work. They did not protect their citizens they're responsible for. Well, Okay, then we do it ourselves. Um, first of all, I was invited to come to Bonaire and gave a talk, and it was a much better talk than here because I was invited on the free winds and could stand on the Titan altar, um, which was a place I tried to avoid for years when I lived on Curaçao. But now we were there. There were 120, 150 people, I think. And when you know that there are were 12,000 people living on the island. That was 1% of the citizens of Bonaire on that Sunday morning. I think a really, really good audience. And in the same days, I discussed with some civil servants of the island the importance to make local libel bylaws. As I told, these ABES and IBES gave the possibility to make local bylaws. And I thought we cannot lobby in The Hague when we haven't used all the possibilities given by the legislation to do something. So we came up with a bylaw for the spelling of Papiamento, which was also thrown away by the Dutch government because they were not interested, and a bylaw on the language used in administrative matters. And then in 2015, there was the first meeting with the committee of experts. This was a very exciting moment for us. We were happy that we had good context with the NGOs in Friesland who told us right in time 
now you have to raise your voice uh, because Plika not only worked in The Hague, but also built a very good network with other minority language speaking organizations in the Netherlands. So we prepared a big, big file on Papiamento, on the state reform, on the impossibility to make new reservations after signing a treaty, on the impossibility to make different levels of human rights protection in one country. And I was really irritated because we explained everything. And then the Dutch civil servant who was considered an expert said, well, I just looked it up on Wikipedia. And I think it's a little bit different as you said. I could have changed Wikipedia the night before. I didn't think about that. But they gave a statement. They asked the Dutch government in a long, long paragraph to explain the state reform and the place of Bonaire in this new structure. And the Netherlands had to come up with answers, answers, answers. But it took four years before the experts were coming again to the Netherlands. Four, year, four long years, definitely, for the Academia Papiamento, who, of course, as a group of volunteers, wanted to see some development. And there wasn't much development. It was in Maastricht. We had the second meeting in 2019. And now the chairman said, I have tried to understand all your arguments on Papiamento, the state reform, but I'm interested in languages and your legal arguments, that's rocket science. Um, I cannot explain this to my other experts. That was quite disappointing. But the interesting thing was, he said, when I look at the article one of the charter, it's about minority or regional language or language which are not an official language historically spoken in a territory. For us, it's much easier when you come up with facts that Papiamento is long, long spoken in the Netherlands. And the funny thing was, I said, I knew this in 2009, but at that time I didn't have the historical data. In the meantime, I think all of you know these looted letters found in English archives from letters sent from Curaçao to Holland in the, the 18th century. And there is one letter from, I think, 1782 from a mother and her newborn son to the father who is living in Rotterdam. And the whole letter is in Papiamento. So we could prove that Papiamento was used in the Netherlands long, long, long ago. And all the steps afterwards were much easier to, to yeah, include, to give the historical data up to today. This convinced the committee of experts. Oh yeah, I must say, I stepped in the car, I started writing, and not the next morning, but one and a half days later, the first draft of 20 pages was there. It was sent to the experts, and I knew that they were meeting the Dutch civil servants one day later. They simply presented my report and said, you should be with something, because according to this part two, you must give provisions for all the minority languages fitting into Article 1 used in your territory. So we are not going to discuss whether Bonaire is a best island, whether there's an iron curtain in the middle of the ocean. We simply see that this language is historically spoken. That 
really changed the position of the game because 2019, of course, everybody knows, um, some months later, COVID started. But even in this COVID period, there were a series of meetings, and these were very interesting meetings between the Inner Affairs Ministry, the Culture and Education Ministry, um, and the Open by Lichaam Bonaire, the local government of Bonaire. And the interesting thing was that Splica and Academia Papiamento were all the time at the table at these meetings discussing not only what should happen and could happen, but also changing drafts all the time. Luckily now also the online, like today, Zoom meetings were used. So the people from Bonaire could simply work from Bonaire. The people in Holland worked most of the time from home. Um, and this resulted in a intergovernmental covenant, bestuursafspraak, papiaments op Bonaire. In this covenant was yeah, said that in 2030, there should not be an alphabetism in papiamento on Bonaire. That sounds great. I'm not going to discuss that. For me, the most important thing was that the, in this agreement, the way to get the charter applicable on the Bonaire, on Papiamento, was set as one of the goals. So in March 2021, there was a clear decision by the Dutch government to get the charter under part three applicable on Bonaire. We have seen this. And somewhere in April this year, the Council of Ministers of the Kingdom, yeah, let's say, accepted the proposal to make the charter under part three applicable on Bonaire. And it was sent formally by the Minister of Foreign Affairs because the Minister of Foreign Affairs is responsible for international treaties to the king. There are two documents, a toelichtende nota and a bijlage by the toelichtende nota. Uh, strange words, I'm not going to discuss them, but normally we have clear words for the legislative procedure when there is a new law to be made. But here, the way to make an international treaty, which is already signed applicable on a new language in a new ter ter territory, was a sort of, yeah, they had no idea how to come there or what to do. We will see that later. And then now a couple of days ago, where is it? Bescherming papiaments niet mogelijk. The Council of State is of the opinion that the charter cannot be applicable on Bonaire, or at least this part three. Is that true? Well, I think at least law students, but maybe also journalists, should read documents from the first page till the last page. And when I read it, the message of the Council of State of the Kingdom is quite clear. Part three can be applicable. And I will discuss that in the next 
20 slides full of words. Part three can be applicable when more data is provided. And part two is directly applicable on Bonaire on Papiamento. The Council of State asks the Dutch government to come up with better data. And they come to the conclusion that with this toelichting and bijlage op toelichting, at least the civil servants were not able to count up to 35, the minimum of measures to be made applicable on a certain language. What, what happened? As I said, there were a series of measures the government can subscribe, sign, make applicable. When we look at education, we take the Article 8, first paragraph under B. This is the menu of possibilities to be used in primary education. So the two green ones are the measures the Dutch government wants to make applicable on Bonaire. It will make available primary education in the relevant languages, papiamento. And it will provide within primary education for the teaching of relevant languages as an integral part of the curriculum. And here, a red light started with the Dutch government or the Dutch Council of State. I think you see here very clear the flexibility of the charter, giving it a very small scope or a very broad scope. And when you look into all the material accompanying the charter, you should look, not look, but you should analyze the position of the language in society, the role it plays um, to pick the right protection level. One of the critics in Friesland is that in 19... 96, the Dutch government has chosen certain paragraphs from this menu and never changed it afterwards. So when you now pick it, you're probably bound to it quite a while. So it's not only good or, but you see here, but there is one little problem. Who is studying law and already got in Leiding Recht, one of the first classes when you start to studying law, is some really basic education in logic. And you see here three times this word or, and the question is, what does the word or means? Is this a thing you can add up to each other? or this, or this, or this, and you sign them all three or four, or can you only pick one? As I said, the whole idea of the charter is to give little protection a little bit more, more and more. So yes, when you guarantee the highest level of protection, you can also sign up for all the lower protection, but it is useless. So the or here is an exclusive or. That means, and I was showed also with the, three, the charter itself, that you can either choose one or two or three or four. You cannot choose one and three. So the Council of State said, there ain't 35 paragraphs made applicable. There are 34, and there are three comparable also for primary education and for, uh, what is it, for higher education. So at least 
they came up with the analysis. Ah, here is the article, we leave it out. It also says that it's exclusive. And also the Council of State said that this is not a cumulative opsomming. So you're not allowed to pick two, you only are allowed to pick one. That means that there are not 35 paragraphs signed, but 34 and 33 and 32. So the Dutch government, first of all, has to come up with really 35 paragraphs made applicable. And they have to be taught how to use the word or. Here we see the other possibility. In the criminal proceedings, I have put it in red, you can provide that courts at the request of one of the parties shall conduct the proceedings in the regional or minority language and or, so then it's allowed to pick the second one, guarantee the accused the right to use his or her regional or minority languages and or, and then the last one, to produce on request documents connected with the legal proceedings in the relevant language. Here, the Council of State came up with other beren op de weg, other problems. In Friesland, only paragraph two and three are subscribed. So I think Papiamento is getting a higher level of protection on Bonaire is Frisian in Friesland. That is good. Good, might be good, but in Friesland, there is really a very detailed law on the use of language in court. Every step is arranged. It's, uh, I think, two, three pages, the whole law. Um, and one of the most important features in this law is the obligation to have everything spoken in Frisian in court put in the no tools in that language. In the Rijkswetgemeenschappelijke Hof, the kingdom law on the combined courts of all the islands here in the Caribbean, all the Dutch islands, there is only written the court will make its decisions in Dutch. The language just which can be used are English, Dutch, and Papiaments. The word voertale, languages, has no legal definition anywhere in the Dutch legal system. I have no idea what the voertaal is, I can think about it. But in the end, I think we need a law. Funny thing is, I do not only think that. Also last Friday here on Bonaire, one of the judges who was uh, put under oath and who was installed clearly said this in Papiamento. She didn't use Dutch, but put the Dutch version on Facebook saying, of course, we use all the three official languages of the court. And next to that, also Spanish. There is maybe not a law about this, but she simply says, Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights makes, gives me the obligation to give everybody a fair process. When we then look at the Council of State, they come up with many, many strange arguments. Yes, of course, the 
court decisions must be written in Dutch. But then they said, and maybe, maybe there are judges and lawyers living on Bonaire who are coming from Europe, from the Netherlands there. And so we cannot allow such a broad use of papiamento. And next to that, alle burgerlijke en strafzaken, all the civil and penal law cases, can end up, can end up at the High Court, the Hoge Raad in The Hague. And there, all the procedures will be in the Dutch language. I think there is also the most important argument to have all the papiamento words put in the red tape paperwork in papiamento because the Hoge Raad never sees any party. They don't see the litigants, they only see lawyers. So it's very important that they are well informed about the exact wordings of the witnesses or the other people involved. Um, so they come up with the very, very, yeah. Article nine, the provisions must be changed and Papiamento should get a lower protection. It doesn't say that it's not possible to use Papiamento and the Charter on Bonaire. I think the Council of State should listen to intelligent judges like Ms. Martin. Administrative authorities and public service. There it becomes interesting. They say that the Article 10 contains several provisions that have to apply to regional authorities or local authorities. And the government only says that these articles are applicable on the Island Council. And we all know there is no province, there is no regional authority on Bonaire. There is directly the Dutch government in The Hague, but all the powers of the provinces in the Netherlands are either placed at the Rijksdienst Caribisch Nederlands or at the Openbaar Lichaam Bonaire. So they say, we, we set the vraagtekens by toepassing verklaren van deze bepaling over zowel regionale als lokale autoriteiten, daar waar het uiteindelijk gaat over één bestuurslaag. Dit moet nader toegelicht worden. When we look at the article, I've put it here in green. All these green, so all the articles are made applicable on Papiamento on Bonaire. And then we see in A, the use of regional or minority languages within the framework of the regional or local authority. What does this word or means? You studied law. What does or mean? Must it be applicable on both regional and no on both regional authority and the local authority, or can it simply be applicable on one or the other? It's quite simple. Either the one or the other. And when the other doesn't exist, there is no problem. Beren op de weg. So there is one problem in the whole list. This is this number E, which only talks about 
the regional authorities and the use of the minority language in their assemblies. Well, of course, the Autoriteit Caribisch Nederland has no assembly. There is no election to raise your voice in this organization. So only the letter E will be skipped. But I said we were already on 32, so now we are on 31 of the 35 as a minimum. It's, I think, really a big shame that the Council of State has no legal knowledge on this level. And I think after all the Batuslage affairs, they should really think about their policies. They are working against the citizens and not for the citizens. So back to the article. I think it's not chosen by the Dutch government. But bescherming papier mens niet mogelijk. At least the heading, most probably not made by the journalist, but by someone making the layout, gives a completely wrong impression of the work to be done done in the next period. So when the Dutch government picks this Article 11 under G, they can make a difference. And since it's not yet chosen and we were on 31, maybe we now come to 32. Culture. I'm not living on Bonaire, so it's for me quite difficult to find out what is exactly happening there. Last year, I was invited by to visit the Arte di Palabra, a fascinating festival for the youth to give presentations, to give talks. And I didn't find it year in all this paperwork. I come back to that. So, indien blijkt dat de bepalingen in de praktijk niet kunnen worden toegepast, adviseert zij het van toepassing verklaren van deze maatregelen te heroverwegen. So we're going to lose at least two other provisions. 31, we were now we're back to 29. Um, when we look at this article 12, paragraph 1 under F, the Dutch government guarantees that they will encourage direct participation by representatives of the user of a given re regional or minority language in providing facilities and planning cultural activities. And the civil servants in The Hague say, het Nederlands cultuurbeleid is gericht op een divers cultuurbeleid. Wij van WC Eind adviseren WC Eind. I can imagine that, that the Dutch Council of State does not accept this kind of flimsy argumentation. Where is the Art di Palabra? Where is the Academia Papiamento? Where is the Blijts Nota Culture Bonaire? Where is the local museum? And these institutions ain't gonna disappear in two or three weeks. So also with the next visit of these experts, the Dutch government will be able to present their work. So I think, and here the Raad van State is doing something very strange. I already said the Dutch government has to write these reports every two years, and there's a committee of experts. And at this committee of experts, also the language speakers are invited to give their opinion. The Council of State is placing itself on the seat of this committee of experts, and they are not engaging in a dialogue with the minority language speakers. 
So they either completely misunderstand their role or they think we are sitting here in the Hague behind the desk and we ain't going to think, we ain't going to do. We simply write nice, very, very strong words, but it doesn't work that way. So here are the things. And going back to this slide, we have already seen, we simply can come to the conclusion that it has nothing to do with no possibility to have Papiamento protected under part three. It's about coming up with better data, better underbowing, better arguments. And part three can be applicable on Bonaire directly. And of course, since the Dutch civil servants were not able to count up to 35, they have to get some lessons in counting up to 35. The good thing is that the Council of State said that the whole parliamentary process, very, very necessary according to the Dutch ministers, is not necessary. Only a letter by the Minister of Foreign Affairs to the Council of Europe will fulfill the needs to have it applicable on Bonaire under part three. And since we are here on Aruba tonight, and since I'm working also with the people on Aruba a long, long time, I must say something about Aruba. Here, the Toelichtende Nota, so the explanatory report, is very, very clear. Het handvest zal niet mede gelden voor Aruba, omdat het papiamens daar een officiële taal is. En volgens artikel 1, een uitsluitend toegepast wordt op regionale talen, die verschillen van de officiële talen. So, to translate it in English. The charter cannot be applicable on Aruba, on the Papiamento spoken there, because it's an official language in Aruba. And according to Article 1 of the charter, it can only be applicable on regional languages, which are different from the official language. Strange thing is, that there are countries in Europe where minority languages have a very official status. For example, Gaelic in Ireland, and thus the government of Ireland insisted on putting in the explanatory report of the charter one sentence saying that also quasi or full official languages which are endangered, which need special protection, can be protected under the Charter. So they have put in the explanatory report from 1996, I think, the words, if a state wishes such a less widely used official language to benefit from the measures of protection and promotion, provided by the Charter, it is therefore enabled to determine that the Charter shall apply to it. And then there are some nice other words. What are they doing down there? I think one of the biggest problems is that these civil servants are shifted from one post to the next every two, three years and come on completely new subjects and on the bottom line have no idea what they are doing. Luckily, the Council of Europe has offered the Dutch government, what is it? I think last Wednesday, technische bijstand, technical support, to count to 35 and make 
the charter applicable on Bonaire. For Aruba, I would at least advise everybody to get your paperwork ready, contact the committee of experts, maybe your own government in advance. At this moment, let's say the whole charter is back on the taken tafel, on the drawing board in the Netherlands. When you can convince your politicians to ask for Mede Gelding to have it here applicable, do it now. When the government is not responding, make sure via Splica. Oh, now my computer is crashing almost. That's stupid. Um, make it, yeah, talk with the experts. And safe by the bell, I think, I hope. Yeah, okay. Um, so some final remarks. Um, as I started talking in English for the people of Stacia and Saba, I think it's completely unexplainable why the charter will not be applicable on the English of Saba and Station. Under part three. But the good thing is that they are already protected under part two, which is a less broad scope. But you can imagine that keeping Academia Papiamento run, running on an island with 12 or 15,000 inhabitants is already a big, big effort. And having two new NGOs on islands with 1,200 people is really, really hard. But I'm always open to explain them, to share the knowledge and so on. The Council of Europe has many other human rights treaties, which are also not applicable on the best islands. For example, the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities. When the charter is applicable and can be applicable on Bonaire, there is no legal argument one can find to say that the framework convention is not. Luckily, also last June, Academia Papiamento and Splica were able to talk with the expert committee of the framework convention, and we are waiting for their report and we hope that they put a firm statement in favor of Bonaire in that report. And then there is, and I always like that, the European Charter for Local Self-Government, also by the Council of Europe, also not applicable on the best. I think we can imagine why, but I leave that to the next generation, I think. Um, it's, I think, for the people who are involved in Papiamento here on Bonaire known, but today is the birthday of Ramon Tat Dandre. And uh, he mailed me, he said, I'm in Holland. And in Holland, it, it's now, my computer says it's two o'clock in the morning. Uh, but,
And now I think, I hope, I suppose at least we can, you may pose some questions because maybe I explained the whole thing from a very legal point of view. Um, so I think the easiest way is um, that I simply repeat here the question or are we gonna run with the microphone through the, yeah, okay. Are there questions? Uh -huh. No. No, what, what, what I can say is that I'm a lawyer. I'm one of the few people who wrote a PhD on this subject. And I think I have an obligation to share this knowledge. I think we see this also in the Netherlands in the past years. For example, when you look at the Urgenda case or the Shell Milieu Defensie case, um, yes, we need people in the street. I cannot talk for Papiamento or for Bonaire, but the whole society has become highly, highly judicized, which means that also these very technical roads can be fruitful in the end. And we are not yet there. And I think even with, with laws, we ain't gonna save a language. Raising awareness is important. I think making the Dutch government co-responsible for the language is very important. So this technical path is the way I can help. But at the bottom, we need the journalists who write every day, six, seven, or maybe even more newspapers full with papiamento. In Friesland, there's only every Saturday a bylage in Frisian. We need the writers, we need the teachers, we need all these people, and they need the support to fulfill their task. But what I did is, as I said, from this really legal point of view, the way I can help it. So that's, I think, very, very 2020, where we use courts or here these expert committees to get our rights. And that is maybe also a strange thing, only two or three people can. So let me do that. And my papiamento is still very, very basic. Um, so there I'm not gonna add something by speaking it, but by helping Academia Papiamento or Splica. And I must say, Papiamento, when we accomplish this, and even when we accomplish it under part two, it is the first language which gets this status in the past 25 years. So all the other languages were promoted by government and put on this list by government and never an NGO or two or three NGOs pushed it that far. Yeah. It's very technical. One quick. Is there any law in the United States? 
No, the, as I said in the first place, on international level, there is certain fear for group rights. So here they transformed it into a sort of individual rights. But on the United Nations level, there are only um, no treaties. There are only non-binding instruments which put, yes, stress on the importance of the mother tongue, of regional languages. So they really stress, uh, when we go back to, to Guinea, the language talked by enslaved people, at least on Curaçao and maybe also here, when somewhere in 1920, 1930, the last speaker died, the songs disappeared, the knowledge about food disappeared, the knowledge about the past disappeared. So these cultural elements are very important for the United Nations, but they are not transferred to international binding legal documents. Um, so my question is what changes for the people's blood in the next time? So, um, for example, one of the things that we are looking at in the past is Um, talk the language, use it. The Arte di Palabra, it was such fun to see it. It was not about, but in the end, I think back there is a young lady who makes rap songs in Papiamento. And I said, the charter makes it, let's say not obligatory, but it says it's very important that the language speakers from different regions where the language is used have the possibility to communicate with each other. So make an online rap festival with people from Bonaire, from Curaçao, from Aruba, from the Netherlands, and in the end, get money from the Netherlands because they are now obliged to put effort in making this cross-border exchange between language speakers possible. Um, in the Netherlands with Frisian, it's, for example, the Twares. Maybe you have, you know Twares, the, the pop group. They were popular, I think, seven, eight years ago. And their song in Frisian was broadcasted for months and months and months. That makes clear in the rest of the Netherlands that the language counts, that it is alive, that it is supported. So most of the time you cannot predict this in advance, um, but get together and do what you like the most and do that in Papiamento. Yes, the, the France is part of the Council of Europe member states, um, and France very strangely signed the charter, but then did not put it in force because the French Council of State said that when the charter is applicable in France, since France is one a indivisible, it cannot be separated, it must be applicable on all the languages of France, including the 70 Arawak languages in French Guyana, the Creole languages here in the Caribbean, um, 
and then they stop. Now they're still working on it, but we're now 25 years later and they're still, every five years there's a new report. Um, but I can imagine that it is also writing this, this report by the Netherlands and then have it evaluated by the Council of Europe experts. These are 30 page reports. So when you have to write a 30 page report for 70 languages in Guyana, you have a problem. But on the other hand, I used these arguments that France from the beginning said the charter must be applicable on the Creole languages to say, it's not about European languages, it's about languages spoken in the European territory. So I used the, the, the case of France. I used the Spanish case because in Spain, also the Berber and Arabic languages spoken on little islands uh, in the sea uh, near Morocco are protected under the charter. So it said it's not about what we think is a European language. It's simply a language spoken on the territory. So in these big paperwork for the experts, I came up with these kind of arguments to promote, yeah. Well, when you take the first article of the charter as literary as the Dutch government does it by saying that only non-official languages can be protected on Aruba, only Spanish or what kind of form you would be interested can be protected, but it must be spoken the language of course still. Um, that languages are unfortunately not protectable. But for example, for Sabia and Stasia, I think you should say that the Caribbean variant or the local variant is the protected language and not English as spoken um, by these English officials in the last days. Yeah. Yes, one question. Uh, yeah, we, Alice, please. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely is a lack of knowledge. The, the civil servants in the Netherlands have written a report where their arguments to make certain options applicable on the Papiamento of Bonaire was such a short sentence. For example, with the use of Papiamento in the administration of the Openbaar Lichaam, they simply said, there is an article in the IBES of ABES or whatsoever, that's it. They didn't mention the local bylaws on the use of language in administration, where there is a very balanced procedure for the use of Volgentaal, beleid they call it. So in principle, the government tries to follow the language used by the citizen. And when at a certain moment, the OLB uses Papiamento and there comes someone who wants to have a translation in Dutch, there is a whole system to decide whether this person gets a free translation or not. Um, it's not mentioned. That's very, very strange. You can find these bylaws simply in the, uh, what is it, the overheid.nl. For all the other points, they should have discussed it with the people on Bonaire. We would have come up with many things happening in society to get a good set of data. And I think they worked behind the desk in The Hague and it was raining 
and it was very very cold and no uh, it's it's very disappointing that up to this Bastur's accord there was a good dialogue with the NGOs and at that moment they closed the windows closed the doors again tried to do it on their own and were not able to count up to 35. That's one online question, and that's about Splika. Who are the members, and uh, are they representing the Caribbean? The question is whether Splika is representing the Caribbean. I oh, um, no, and that's not necessary because in the Caribbean there is a whole series of representatives who promote Papiamento who are involved in this process. So as I said, the people of Bonaire are, can, or will be represented by the Academia Papiamento. The people from, now I'm mixing them all up and Joyce is looking at me. <laughs> now, and also in Curaçao and Aruba, there are NGOs and Splika is representing the Papiamento speaking people in the Netherlands. And all these four organizations form together a sort of Plataforma Papiamento where they skip all the political, all the stupid discussions about Papiamento and Papiamento and simply try to work together, try to exchange ideas, good practices, knowledge, to help it and mm -hmm. I think that is the, the, the much better as uh, making an organization in the Netherlands in any way representing people from the Caribbean and I know that the let's say interaction between these organizations is really very very frequent when there are seminars or other things organized in the Netherlands from all the four places where a lot of Papiamento is spoken, people join at least when it's online. And uh, I think that is a very professional cooperation. I hope that this answered your question. And I would say, or there is really, really in question, otherwise I'm still here and we simply put out the, uh, the video and we have a nice talk. There is at least some cafe outside. Okay. <laughs> and then all the all the lookers or people watching it somewhere in the country, thank you for listening and hope to see you soon. Bye bye.